This is Theory of Change. I'm Matthew Sheffield. Thanks for joining me for another episode. Less than five years ago, setting rumors and misinformation wasn't a controversial job. It most definitely is now, however, thanks to a powerful group of reactionary politicians and activists who have realized that improving the quality of our political discourse has a negative effect on their electoral chances. Now, we live in a social media environment in which everything from harmless speculation to flagrant lying isn't just permissible, it's encouraged, especially on X, the badly disfigured remains of Twitter purchased by Elon Musk. My guest on today's episode, Renee DeResta, saw all of this happen in real time, not just in the public discourse, but to herself as well, after she became the target of a coordinated smear campaign against the work that she and her colleagues at the Stanford Internet Observatory were doing to study and counteract internet falsehoods. Those actions were a bridge too far, however, for Jim Jordan, the far-right Republican House member from Ohio, who seems to believe that any kind of information quality standard is going to harm Republicans. Under congressional subpoena threats and multiple lawsuits, SIO was forced to close its doors this last June. It was a significant victory for purveyors of disinformation. Not only had they led to the censorship and closure of a private organization that they despised, they have also intimidated any other university or government agency that might dare to document and expose online falsehoods. But even if Jordan and his lackeys had not succeeded, however, it's worth noting that people wanting to believe comforting lies and terrifying falsehoods is not a problem of technology. It's one of epistemology. Is there a way forward in all of this? It's a question that Renee and I discuss among many other topics in this episode. I hope you'll enjoy. And joining me now is Renee DeResta. Welcome to Theory of Change, Renee. It's good to Welcome be back. back. Thank you. It's yeah. good to be back. Yeah. Well, so um, your uh, book and your career has upset a lot of people. I think that's fair <laughs> to say. Uh, and uh, I guess maybe more your career more recently. So for people who don't aren't familiar with your story, why don't you maybe just give it a little overview, which is in the book. So yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I guess I'm trying to think of where to start. I uh, spent the last five years until June of this year at the Stanford Internet Observatory. I was the technical research manager there. Um, I studied what we call adversarial abuse online. So understanding the abuse of online information ecosystems, um, different types of actors, different types of tactics and strategies, sometimes related to trust and safety, sometimes related to disinformation or influence operations, sometimes related to generative AI or new and emerging technologies. And um, we treated the internet as a holistic ecosystem. And so our argument was that as new technologies and new actors and new entrants kind of came into the space, um, you know, you'd see kind of cascading effects across the whole of social media. Uh, a lot of the work that I did focused on propaganda and influence and um, influencers as a <laughs> sort of linchpin in this particular media environment. And so I recently wrote a book about that. Uh, hold on, let me unmute myself. Um, there we go. Yeah, and uh, well, and, and, and you got into all this uh, based on your uh, involvement in being in favor of vaccines and yes uh, yeah yeah i was um people who were not <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> i know i got into it by like fighting on the internet i guess uh back in 2014 um no i was um you know i had my first kid in 2013 my son and uh i was living in san francisco i'd moved out there about two years prior and you have to do this thing in san francisco where you put your kid on all these like preschool waiting lists um and uh, not, not even like fancy preschool, just like any preschool, you've got to be on a waiting list. And so I was filling out these forms and I started trying to Google to figure out where the vaccine rates were, because at the time there was a whooping cough outbreak in California. And there were all of these articles um, about how, you know, at the Google daycare vaccination rates were lower than South Sudan's verbatim. This was uh, one of the headlines. Um, 
And I thought, you know, I, I don't want to send my kid to school in that environment. And um, I want to send him to a place where I'm not risking him catching easily preventable diseases. This is not a crazy preference to have, it turns out. But it was <laughs> on the Internet. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And so I got really interested in, in that dynamic and how I, I felt like my desire to keep my kid safe from preventable diseases um, had been a accepted part of the social contract for decades. And all of a sudden, I have a baby and I'm on Facebook and Facebook is constantly pushing me anti-vaccine content and anti-vaccine groups with hundreds of thousands of people in them. So I started joining some of the groups because I was very curious, like what happens in these groups? Why are people so, uh, you know, so compelled to be there? And it was very interesting because it was, um, it was like, it was like a calling, right? They, they weren't in there because they had some questions about vaccines. They were in there because they were absolutely convinced that vaccines caused autism, caused SIDS, caused allergies, and all of these other, you know, lies, candidly, right? Things that we know not to be true, but they were really evangelists for this. And there was no counter evangelism, right? There were parents like me who quietly got our kids vaccinated, nothing happened, and we went on about our days. And then there were people who thought they had a bad experience or who had, you know, distrust in the government, distrust in science, and they were out there constantly putting out content about how evil vaccines were. And I just felt like there was a real asymmetry there. Um, fast forward maybe a couple months after I started looking at those daycare rates and lists and uh, you know, preschool. And there was a measles outbreak at Disneyland. And I thought, oh my God, you know, <laughs> measles is back, you know, and um, measles is back in California in, uh, in, in 2014. Um, so that was where I started feeling like, okay, um, we could take legislative steps to improve school vaccination rates. And I wanted to be involved. Um, and I met some other very dedicated, mostly women uh, who did as well. And we started this organization called Vaccinate California. And it was really, you know, the mission was this vaccine kind of uh, advocacy. But the learnings were much more broadly applicable, right? It was how do you grow an audience? How do you add target? How do you take a couple thousand dollars from like friends and family and put that to the best possible use to grow a following for your page? How do you get people to want to share your content? What content is the kind of content you should produce, like what is influential, what is appealing. Um, and so it was this, you know, kind of building the plane while you're flying it sort of experience. I was like, hey, everybody on Twitter is using bots. This is crazy. Do we need bots? All right, I guess we need bots, you know? <laughs> and uh, and just having this experience in um, 2015 or so is when, when all this was going down. Um, and, you know, we did get this law passed, this, this kind of pro-vaccine campaign to improve school vaccination rates. It did pass. But I was more struck, again, by what was possible um, and by a feeling of, um, I guess, alarm at some of the things that were possible, right? That you could add target incredibly granularly with absolutely no disclosure of who you were or where your money was coming from. Um, that you could run automated accounts to just to harass people, right? To kind of constantly barrage or, or post about them. Uh, that none of this was in any way, um, it certainly wasn't illegal, but it, it wasn't even really like immoral. It was just a thing you did on the internet. And there were other things around that time, right? Gamergate happened around the same time. Um, ISIS grew big on social media around the same time. And so, you know, I just felt like, uh, okay, here's the future. <laughs> every, every campaign going forward is going to be just like this. And, um, you know, I remember talking about it with people at the CDC, right? They asked us to come down and present at this conference, made a whole deck about what we had done and, you know, this pro-vaccine mom group uh, and was really struck by how, like, unimpressed they were by the whole thing. <laughs> Not that, you know, we felt like we should be getting, like, kudos for what we had done, but that they didn't see it as a battleground, that they didn't see it as a source of influence, as a source of where public opinion was shaped, that they didn't see groups with hundreds of thousands of people in them as a source of alarm. And the phrase that they said that I reference in the book a bunch of times is these are just some people online, right? So there's a complete lack of foresight of what was about to happen uh, because of this belief that institutional authority 
was enough to carry the day. And my yeah. distinct sense that it was not. Well, and also that they did not understand that, um, you know, a, I mean, I, I think we, we have to say that at the outset that while you were encountering all this content, anti-vaccine content, that that's not what the majority opinion was. The majority right. opinion was pro-vaccine. And, yes. um, and, and, and so, yeah, with these bots and, you know, all these other different tactics of, sh you know, agreeing to share, you know, mutual links and whatnot, um, they're able to make themselves seem much more numerous than they really exactly. are. Yep. And and then eventually then the algorithm kicks in and then that promotes the stuff also. Um and and you have a phrase which you uh have used in the book and used over the years, which I like, which is that if you if you make it trend, you make it true. Um so what does that what does that mean? So I it was almost a um you know, you essentially create reality, right? This is the thing that we're all talking about. This is the thing that everybody believes. Um, majority illusion is what you're referencing there, right? You make yourself look a lot bigger than you are and algorithms come into play that help you do that. And in a way it becomes, um, it becomes something of a self-fulfilling prophecy. So the, you know, there's a certain amount of activity and energy there. The thing gets, you know, the content, whatever it is, gets engagement, the hashtag trends, there is so much effort that was being put in in the 2014 to 2016 or so time frame into getting things trending because it was an incredible source of like attention capture. You were putting an idea out there into the world. And if you got it done with just enough people, it would be pushed out to still more people. The algorithm would kind of give you that lift. And then other people would click in and would pay attention. And so there was a real um, means of galvanizing people by calling attention to your cause and making them feel kind of compelled to join in. So one of the things that we saw, I'm trying to remember if I even referenced this part in the book, was um, the, uh, the ways in which you could like connect different factions on the internet. I have a graph of this that I show in a lot of talks um, where what you see is like the very long established anti-vaccine communities in 2015, the people who've been on there screaming about vaccines causing autism for years, um, they didn't get a lot of pickup with that narrative. There were still enough people who were like, no, I don't know, like the research is over here. This is what it says. And you see them pivot the the frame of the argument after they lose a couple of um, couple of votes in the California Senate, I think it was. And you see them move from talking about the sort of health impacts, the sort of the things that we call misinformation, right? Things that are demonstrably false. You see them pivot instead to a frame about rights, about health freedom, medical freedom. And you see them, um, they call it marrying the hashtags is the language that they use when they're telling people on their side to do this, which is to tweet the hashtag for the bill, some of the vaccine hashtags. And then they say, tag in, you might remember this one, TCOT, top conservatives on Twitter, um, or uh, hashtag 2A, which is the Second Amendment people, you know, for a long time before the First Amendment became the be all end all on Twitter, it was actually the Second Amendment that was the thing that that you would see kind of conservative factions uh, fighting over. This is the days of the Tea Party. And so you saw the anti-vaccine activists, again, these people who held this deeply held belief in the health lies, instead pivoting the conversation to focus instead on, okay, it doesn't matter what the vaccines do, you shouldn't have to take them. And that becomes the thing uh, that actually enables them to really kind of grow this big tent. And you see the movement begin to expand as they start making this appeal to um, more sort of a, you know, libertarian or Tea Party politics that was um, that was quite prominent on on Twitter at the time. So essentially, that mm -hmm. is how they managed to grow the community. So the make it trend, make it true thing was just, um, you know, if you could get enough people paying attention to your hashtag, your rumor, your content, nobody's going to see the counter movement, the counter fact check, the thing that's going to come out after the trend is over. It's the trend that's going to capture attention, stick in people's mind and become the thing that they, uh, that they think about as, uh, you know, reality when they're referencing the conversation later. Well, and, and the reason for that um, is uh, this other idea, which you talk about, which is that media is additive. That um, when people think that, well, I, you know, I can somehow s stop 
bad views from being propagated on the internet. Like that's not true. And, no, not. <laughs> and, it, and it never, and it never was. Um, right. And like you, I mean, you can definitely lessen the impact because I mean, I think it is the case, for instance, that uh, Tucker Carlson, once he was taken off Fox News, you know, his influence has declined quite a bit. Um, and uh, Milo Yiannopoulos, another example, that uh, now now he's reduced to saying that he's a uh, he's an ex-gay uh, Catholic activist. That's, <laughs> that's I saw that go by. Up. Yeah, no, I, I definitely saw that one go by. There's one thing that happens though, where Twitter steps in at some point also because they realize that a lot of the efforts to make things trend are being driven uh by bots and things like this right by by automated accounts um and so they come up with at this point rubrics for what they consider to be a low quality account is the term and that has been you know reframed now and <laughs> the political you know the sort of political uh, polarized arguments about social media but the low quality account vision you know that that went into it was this idea that they wanted trends to be reflective of real people and real people's opinions and so you do see them trying to come in and filter out the um the accounts that appear to be there like to spam or to participate in spamming trends and things like this and so twitter tries to correct for this uh for a while in the 2017 to 2019 time frame it's unclear what has happened <laughs> since mm -hmm. yeah well and 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 i mean and this the idea of you know how to adjust algorithms i mean that is kind of one of the perpetual problems of of all social media is and no i feel like that the people who own these platforms and run them they don't want to admit that any choice any in, in algorithm whether it's you know chron reverse chronological or uh per you know accounts uh, mutuals interest or whatever whatever their metric is um it is a choice and it is a choice to boost things and i it seems like a lot of people in tech they don't they don't want to think that they're doing a choice um i think now maybe they are now now yeah. if you now, if you talk to people um, who work on social media platforms, I don't think that that's a controversial thing to say anymore. I think in 20, again, 2016, 2017 timeframe, there was this idea that there was such a thing as a neutral, right? That, that there was a, um, you know, a, a, a magical algorithmic, pure state of affairs and, um, and this led to some really interesting challenges for them because they ultimately were creating an environment where whoever was the best at intuiting what the algorithm wanted and creating content for it could essentially level up their views. So one of the things that happened uh, was Facebook launches this feature called the Watch Tab. They do it to compete with YouTube. And they don't have the content creator base of YouTube. So there is a bunch of new content creators who begin to try, who realize that Facebook is aggressively promoting the watch tab. So they've created an incentive. And then the watch tab is going to surface certain types of content. So you see these accounts trying to figure out what the watch tab wants to recommend, what it's, what it's geared to recommend. And they evolve over time to creating these kinds of content where the headline, like the, the sort of video title is, um, you know, what she saw when she opened the door, right? Or um, you'll never believe what he thought in that moment, you know, these sorts of like clickbait, clickbait titles. Um, but it works. And the watch tab is pushing these videos out. They're all about like 13 to 15 minutes long, right? So these videos really require a lot of investment. And the audience is sitting there like waiting for this payoff, you know, is like what happens when she opens the door? I don't know. She hasn't opened the door yet. And you just sit there and you wait and you wait and you watch and you watch. And so it's the algorithm thinks this is fantastic, right? It's racking up watch minutes. You know, people are staying on the platform. The creators are earning tons of money They're, You know, this is being pushed out to literally millions of people, even if the pages only have about 10,000 followers. And so you watch this entire ecosystem grow and it's entirely like, content produced solely to capture attention entirely to earn 
the revenue share that that the platform has just made possible. So it's like the algorithm creates an incentive structure and then the content is created to fill it and the influencers that are best at creating the content can profit from it and maximize both their attention, right? The attention, the clout that they're going to get from new followers and also financially to profit from it. So unfortunately, the uh, the idea that there's like some neutral it's just not exactly right. Even if you have reverse chronological, what you're incentivizing is for people to post a whole lot. So they're always at the top of the feed. So it's just this idea that, um, you know, you're always going to have actors responding to those incentives. And this is just what we get on social media. It's not a political thing at all. It's just, you know, it's just uh, creators meeting the, <laughs> the, the rules of the game, right? The algorithms of who was boosted or what was not boosted. Um, like I, I, people eventually started imbuing all kinds of decision, human decisions into algorithms also. Like I, I see that all the time. People, you know, they're like, I'm, I'm shadow banned or I'm this or that. And it's like, and then you look at their posts and they're just kind of boring. You know, they're just some links and uh, especially uh, Twitter now, like they will penalize you if you're not uh, somebody that is regarded as a news source or something like that, whatever the term is they use, like you're going to get penalized if you post a link in the post. Um, and, but a lot of people, they don't know how the algorithms work. And, and so like uh, they think that they're being deliberately individually suppressed and that's just not true. It's, it's weirdly, really narcissistic in a way <laughs> I would see um I would occasionally so some of it is genuine lack of understanding I remember in 2018 having conversations with people as the sort of shadow banning theories were emerging and asking folks like why do you think you're shadow banned these were these accounts that had maybe a couple hundred followers not very much engagement they were not big you know political power players or shit posters or anything just kind of ordinary people and they would say like well my friends don't see all of my posts and that's when you realize that there's like a, a disconnect they, they do not understand that algorithmic curation is the order of the day and that whatever it is that you're creating is competing with a whole lot of other people what other people are creating and you know something somewhere is stack ranking all of this and deciding what to show your friends and so they interpret it as somehow being sort of a, a personal ding on them. And the part that I always found sort of striking was um, when you had the influencers who know better, right, who do understand how this works and the, you know, the, they would use it as a, um, as a monetization strategy, as, a, as an audience capture, sorry, not audience capture, but as an audience attention grab, uh, where they would say like, I, you know, I am so suppressed. <laughs> I, I am so suppressed with you. I only have 900,000 followers. Um, I remember after Elon took over Twitter, I thought, okay, maybe this is going to go away now, but it didn't. Then it turned into, you know, Elon, there's still ghosts in the machine. There's still legacy suppression that's happening. You need to get to the bottom of it. And so it was completely inconceivable to them that like some of their content just wasn't that great or some of their content just wasn't, you know, where the algorithmic tweaks had gone. So one thing that's interesting about the ways that people perceive influencers is they see them as very distinct from media. So when the influencer is, you know, going through this, um, it's it's like an it's like an appeal um, for recognition that that they are somehow over the target, that they are exposing something that is, you know, that that they whoever they is don't want you to know, and so there's this constant narrative that. Uh, the influencer is somehow out there trying to, um, you know, just just speak as an ordinary person. Well, let me try this again. <laughs> I feel like I didn't have a clear uh, okay. clear vision for that. Um, you want me to just talk about what's different between influencers and news then? Uh, yeah, just like, yeah, that right. they see them as the truth teller and uh, something yeah. different and magical almost. So there's an interesting dynamic that happens on social media, which is that people see influencers as being distinct from media, right? They're, um, they present as just them. They're not attached to a branded outlet. Maybe they have a sub stack or something like that, but, um, but they're, they're not seen as being part of a major media institution or brand. And so they're seen as being more trustworthy, right? They're just like me. They're a person who is like me, who is, um, you know, out there, sees the world the way I see it and, you know, what they have to say resonates with me. So it's a, a different model. And one of the things that the influencer has to do um, is they're, they're constantly working to grow that relationship with their fandom. 
And what you start to see happen on social media is that this idea that they are somehow being suppressed, that their truths are somehow being um, prevented from reaching people, it's both a uh, sort of an appeal for, you know, for support, right, for support and validation from the audience. Um, but it's also it also positions them as being somehow very, very important, right? So I am so suppressed uh, because I am so important. I am over the target. I am telling you what they don't want you to know. Uh, so that that presentation kind of makes them seem more interesting. It increases their mystique. It increases their um, their clout particularly among audiences who don't trust media, don't trust institutions, don't trust big tech. So it becomes in a sense, uh, you know, it's almost a, a marketing ploy um, for influencers to say, you know, you should follow me because I am so suppressed. Yeah, well, and, and it's critical to note that this is also fitting into a much larger and longer lasting pattern that has existed on the political right. Uh, since right. the, the idea that mainstream yeah. media is biased against you and your truths. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, here's this, uh, here's this alternative series of outlets. And I think the, yeah, the influencer is just one step um, in that, in that same chain. But what's always interesting to me about it is the, um, the presentation of themselves as distinct from media, even though they have the reach of media, they are presenting themselves as an authoritative source of either information or commentary. And so it's, you know, in, in the realm of the political influencer, especially it's like media, but without the, uh, without the, the, the media brand, everything else is, is very much the same. It is. Yeah. And um, I mean, in a lot of ways, the talk radio is, is the model yeah. here that this is just a, a, slightly different version of it. And and that's why I do think that, you know, like when you look at um, the biggest podcasts or biggest, you know, YouTube show channels and whatnot, like they are almost overwhelmingly right wing because that's the audience has been sort of, that's what they expect. They're used to sitting there listening to somebody talk to them for three hours. Um, where, whereas, you know, on, on the left, or center left, the things have to be a lot shorter. Uh, and they have to be uh, conversations instead of monologues that are right. three hours long. Um, but I mean, you know, of course, but the other issue though is that, I mean, there is an epistemic problem as well yeah. on the right wing in America. I mean, it is the case that, I mean, William F. Buckley Jr., his first book, Got a Man at Yale, was about how these professors were mean because they didn't believe in the resurrection. They were mean because they taught evolution and they didn't take seriously the idea that maybe the earth was recreated in 6,000 years. Uh, you know, maybe that was, the, why, why, why can't we teach the controversy? We need to teach the controversy. Uh, like to me, that's kind of the original alternative fact is evolution yeah. is not true. Um, and, that was a whole thing. Do you remember that was, yeah. um, I remember it would have been, gosh, sometime in the 2014, 2015 timeframe, there was this paper that made the rounds where Google was um, trying to figure out how to assess questions of factuality, right? And um, I'm trying to remember what they called it. it. It had a name. It wasn't like truth rank or something. Maybe it was something, uh, maybe it was that actually. Um, but the media coverage of it, particularly on the right, made exactly this point. Well, how old are they going to say the earth is, you know? <laughs> and that was like the big gotcha. Um, and it you was, weren't there, Renee. So how do you, <laughs> how do you, how do you even know? Um, <laughs> scientists, fossils, who even knows, right? Um, but the, uh, it was an interesting, you know, sort of first glimpse into, at the time people were saying like, Hey, as more and more information is, you know, sort of proliferating on the internet, how do you return good information. And there was that Google knowledge, you know, you started to see search results uh, that returned not just the list of results, but that had the answer kind of up there in the, um, you know, the, the sort of knowledge pane. And if you searched for age of the earth, it would give you the actual age of the earth. And that became a source of some controversy. So one of the first kind of harbingers of what was going to happen is uh, social media platforms, mm -hmm. or search yeah. results, for that matter, search engines tried to tried to curate accurate information as there was a realization that perhaps surfacing accurate information was a worthwhile endeavor. And now it sounds 
you know, controversial to say that. Uh, whereas 10 years ago, it was seen as a, the normal evolution and, uh, you know, helping, helping yeah. computers help you. I think it's unfortunate that there is a lot of discourse about, you know, we, we don't have a shared reality anymore. We don't have, but the unfortunate problem is we never had it. It's just, <laughs> it's, it's just like, you know, for, for in astronomy, you can, a lot of times you can't see pl planets because they don't generate light or you can't see neutron stars because they don't generate light. Um, or, 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 uh, or very little. And, uh, cause like they, in essence, these, these alternative realities, they were always there, but people who work in academia or work in journalism or work in knowledge fields didn't know that they were there. I mean, it is the case that when you look at uh, Gallup polling data, that 40% of American adults say that God created humans in their present form and that they did not evolve. Um, and only 33% say that humans evolved uh, with God guiding the process. And then the smallest percentage, 22%, says that humans evolved and God was not involved in that process. And so like that to me is, is probably the I, but there's all kinds of things about it that you could illustrate that. I mean, these opinions have always been out there. You know, anti-reality was always there. It's just now it affects the rest of us is the problem. That's it. That's an interesting point. I think the um, I remember reading the evolution creation debates on the Internet because they were that was like the original source of, you know, debating and fighting. And you could find that stuff. Internet, yeah. yeah. On the Internet. And. Um, there were the, uh, the flat earthers, but that always seemed like a joke until all of a sudden one day it didn't. Um, mm -hmm. and yeah, the chemtrails, uh, you know, the chemtrails groups. One thing I was struck by was, uh, when I joined some of those anti-vaccine groups, the chemtrail stuff came next, the flat earth stuff, the nine 11 truth stuff. It was just this, uh, this entire, um, yeah, conspiracy correlation matrix, basically, that was just like, oh, you like this, you might also like this and this and this and this and this. Yeah. And so is this uh, interesting glimpse into how these um, the sort of Venn diagrams and those different belief structures. But one thing I think that was distinct is that it was the ones that in that required a deep distrust in government to really continue. So I think that that was also different. I don't think, you know, you would see the evolution debate come up in the context of what should we put in the textbooks, right? This teach the controversy thing that you referenced. Um, but it it didn't, it, it seemed like that existed in a time when trust in government was still higher. Now you have, I think, a lot more conspiracy theories that are really, um, where the belief seems more plausible because people so deeply distrust government. And so that that cycle has been happening. And when you speak about the impact it has, it does then interfere with governance and things like that in a distinctly different way um, than it maybe seemed like it did, you know, two decades ago. Uh, yeah, and at the same time, I mean, you know, I mean, uh, you know, Margaret Thatcher had her famous uh, saying, which she said twice in the interview, that there's no such thing as society. Um, it's, we're, we're just a bunch of individuals. That's all that we are. And yeah, I mean, like, but you're right. I think that it obviously has, has gotten more pronounced and this skepticism has become more of a problem and, but it's become a problem also in the, in the social media space, because trying to do anything to dial back falsehoods, uh, even flagrant ones, dangerous ones that, are you know will cause people to die um that's controversial now and it yeah. and it wasn't and, and you yourself were uh, have experienced that haven't you yeah. <laughs> yeah well i mean you know it it was a um very effective i think kind of grievance campaign um i remember the you know donald trump right was uh I was in office and there was this, do you remember that form they put up like a web form? Have you been censored on social media? Let us know. 
and, yeah. okay, and then they, I think they that got was a, a fundraising boy. They got a bunch told. of dick pics. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> dick pics and an email list. Um, but the, because they wanted like screenshots of evidence, which I thought was uh, it, almost like sweet and how it did not understand what was, you know, <laughs> what was going to yeah. come. The post is deleted. Um, You're not going to see it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the, uh, you know, that, that, that kind of uh, belief that really began to take hold that there was this kind of partisan politically motivated effort to suppress conservatives, despite the abundance of research to the contrary and lack of evidence. It was almost like the lack of evidence was the evidence at some point, you know, uh, well, you can't prove they're not doing it. Well, here's what we see. No, 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 no. That, you know, that research is biased. The wokes did it. Twitter did it. The old regime at Twitter did it. There was no universe in which that catechism was going to be untrue. Right. And so it simply took hold and then they just looked for evidence to support it. And then all of a sudden they looked for evidence to run vast congressional investigations into it. And it, it has always been a, you know, smoke and mirrors. No, they're there, but that doesn't matter at this point because you have political operatives who are willing to, you know, rally support with their base by prosecuting this grievance that their base sincerely believes in because they've heard for five years that it's a real thing. Um, yeah. Well, and, and the thing that, and I can say this having been a, a former uh, conservative activist, that one of the things that made me leave that world was because I did, I was kind of, I mean, I worked in the, in the liberal media bias world of uh, saying yeah. that all the media is out to get Republicans. Um, and so, you know, I, I started getting into this idea on social media. Of, well, are, are they biased against conservatives? And, um, you know, eventually I had the revolutionary and apparently uh, subversive idea that, well, what if Republicans are just more wrong? Uh, <laughs> what if our ideas are not as good? Uh, and maybe that's why uh, people, they get polled. Like, uh, if we believe things that aren't true, then maybe they shouldn't be promoted. Um, and I'll tell you, when I started saying that to people, they uh, they told me to stop talking about that. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, you know, but, and, and, and even now, like, I mean, you, so I, when we should get into, you know, more specifically the things that happened to you, but before the right wing targeted the Stanford Internet Observatory and you, you yourself, um, you know, you were trying to have dialogue with people who were saying these things about yeah. we're being censored, that the big tech is out to get us, et cetera. And you asked them, okay, well, so what kind of rubric do you want? You know, how should we deal with this stuff? You know, obviously, yeah. I assume you don't think that, you know, telling people to buy bleach and drink it for uh, to cure their toenail fungus or whatever, I, you know, but, you know, they they will say they don't agree with that stuff. But then when you ask them, OK, well, so what should we do? We never got a response. To no, there's never really a good answer for that. I mean, one of the things that um, long before joining Stanford, starting in 2015, I started writing about recommendation engines. Right. Because I thought, um, hey, you know the you know anti-vaccine groups are not outside of the realm of acceptable political opinions there's no reason why it shouldn't be on facebook but there is something really weird about a recommender system proactively pushing it to people and then when those same accounts like i said i, I joined a couple of these groups with a you know totally different new account that had no past history of like my actual interests or behavior uh, so i had this you know clean slate account um, joined those groups. Like I said, I got chemtrails, I got flat earth, um, got nine 11 truther, but then I got Pizzagate, Right. And then after I joined a couple of Pizzagate groups, those groups sort of all morphed into QAnon. A lot of those groups became QAnon groups. And so QAnon was getting pushed to this account again, very, very, very early on. And I just thought like, we're in this really weird world. It became pretty clear, pretty quickly that, that QAnon was not just another, conspiracy theory group, right? That QAnon came with some very specific calls to act, that QAnon accounts, like, sorry, no, QAnon um, people, adherence is the word I'm looking for, committed acts of violence or did weird things in the real world. 
And you see Facebook classify it as a dangerous org and begin to, uh, to, to boot it off the platform. But in the early days, that's not happening. And I thought it's, it's weird when the nudge is coming to encourage people to join, as opposed to people proactively going and typing in the thing that they know they want to find and that they're consciously going and looking for. Like that's two different behaviors. It's these sort of push versus pull, we can call it. And I did think, and I do think that as platforms serve as curators and recommenders, that running an entire you know, essentially um, social connection machine, right? That That is orienting people around interests and helping them find new interests does come with a set of, you know, ethical requirements. And so I started writing about like, what might those be? Um, not even saying I had the answers, just saying like, is there, you know, is there some framework, some rubric we can come up with by which we have that, you know, in the phrase that eventually came to um, be associated with that, that idea was freedom of speech, not freedom of reach, right? That you weren't owed a megaphone, you weren't owed algorithmic amplification, there was no obligation for a platform to take your group and proactively push it out to more people. But that in the interest of free expression, it should stay up on the platform, and you could go do the legwork of, you know, growing it yourself if you wanted to. So that was the, uh, that was the idea, right? The question of like, how do you think curation should work? Like something is being upranked or downranked at any given time, whether that's a feed ranking or a recommender system or even a trending algorithm. So what is the best way to do that? And, and I think that is still today the really interesting question about, you know, how to treat narratives on social media. Um, yeah, and it's one that the right is not participating in at no. all. Not at all. And so, I mean, and that's, and the reality is these decisions will be made whether right. they participate or not. Like they have to be made. The, the, these are things that exist and these are businesses that have to be run and they will be made. The, so, and it's, to me, I thought it's, that's been the most consistent pattern in how uh, reactionary people have dealt with you over the years is that they don't. Uh, actually talk to you <laughs> no, <it's laughs> in a easier. serious way. <laughs> it's easier to say like, way. oh, it's all censorship, you know, um, yeah. that that's a very effective, you know, mm -hmm. it's very effective buzzword. It's very effective uh, term mm -hmm. that you can redefine censor, you know, is a nice epithet you can toss at your opponent, but it, um, no, it misses the key question. I think it's worth pointing out by the way, that like every group at some point has like felt that they have been censored or suppressed in some way by a social yeah. media algorithm, right? It's <laughs> the right has made it the central grievance of a political platform, but you do see these allegations with regard to like social media is suppressing marginalized communities, right? That is the thing that, that you hear on the left and have heard on the left for a very long time. Um, social media during the October 7th, you know, the, the day sort of immediately after October 7th in Israel, there was an entire report that came out um, alleging that uh, pro-Palestinian content was being suppressed. Um, unfortunately, the methodology often involves asking people, do you feel like you've been suppressed? And it's you know, stupid. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a terrible, you know, terrible mechanism for assessing these things. But, uh, but, it, but it is, you know, at least one way to see where the kind of pulse of the community is. People don't trust social media platforms. They're, you know, just yeah. not unreasonable, right? They've done some 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 pretty terrible things. Um, you do see, you know, the uh, platforms as they sit there trying to figure out what to uprank or downrank. Um, the loss of, like, the, the lack of understanding and the um, lack of trust come, come into play. Did you see... Um, God, it was yesterday. It was like libs of TikTok going on about how chat GPT was suppressing the Trump assassination because she was using a version that were the it, that had been trained on material prior to the Trump assassination happening. Right. <laughs> oh, you know, no, and and so it's that. such a, it a ridiculous, like just this grievance, but oh my God, the engagement the grievance gets. And again, okay, people yeah. on the internet, they believe stupid things, but then then Ted Cruz 
amplifies it. <laughs> Sitting congressional yeah. regulator, Congress, you know, Senator Ted Cruz is out there amplifying this stupid grievance based on a complete misunderstanding of the technology she's using. And, you know, and, and he sees it as a win. That's why he's doing it. And, and it's like so paralyzingly stupid, actually. But, you know, this is where we are. Yeah. Well, and, and there's a, a guy that you you talk about in the book that I think a lot of people, uh, he kind of fell off the radar uh, because he got arrested. Uh, the guy who uh, whose name is Douglas Mackey. Uh, he went oh, by yeah. Ricky Vaughn uh, on the internet on Twitter. And um, he went on trial for creating a uh, deception operation to tell black voters to not vote on election day. Um and in uh what was it 2016 uh, yeah. and yeah and so he went on trial because that is a crime um and uh, he got convicted of it and uh, he uh, got sentenced as well so but in the in the course of the trial um some of the other uh trolls and, and it's fair to say these people are neo nazis that they that's who they worked with and uh, Mackey was working with weave who is a notorious neo nazi hacker um and anyway, but one of the other trolls involved with this, uh, who went by the name Microchip, um, he said something that I thought was this very frank uh, description of what it is that they're doing. He said, my talent is to make things weird and strange, so there is controversy. And then they asked him, well, did you believe the things you said? And he said, no, and I didn't care. Yeah. And that's that's the problem like how can you have a shared reality with people who that's their attitude and i mean you you get into that sort of toward the end but i don't know it's 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 a question that more people it should is. think about okay. you should write a book about it <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I think it's a it's a hard one i get asked a lot of the time you know, in the the stories, like the stories about me, right? The weird conspiracy theories that I'm like some, you know, that, that the CIA placed me in my job at Stanford. Um, man, I've had some real surreal conversations, including with like print media fact checkers. I got a phone call one day that was like, hey, we're doing this. You know, you're a supporting character. You're tangentially mentioned. But um, hey, I need to ask, uh, mm -hmm. you know, the, the person is saying that the CIA got you your job at, at Stanford. And um that seems a little bit crazy. I was like, it's more than a little bit crazy. <laughs> a little, little bit's not quite it. You know, it's a, uh, I don't even know if that counts as defamatory because it sounds cool, but, <laughs> but it's fucking not true. And, um, you know, and you, and you find yourself in these, like these situations where, you know, I was like, I'm actually, I'm, I'm frankly floored that I am being asked to prove that that is not true when like, what what did what did you ask that guy? Did you did you ask him for some evidence? Did you ask him like mm -hmm. what are you basing this on? Like some online vibes, some shit posts from randos, and then you decide that that this is enough for you to say the thing, and I am the one who has to prove the negative. Denied. Like yeah. it's the weirdest. Like the the I, I felt like um I was actually really irritated by that. To be honest, I was just like, what kind of information environment are we in where um you know where I'm being asked to deny the most stupid spurious allegations and nobody is asking the people pushing them for the evidence and that's where i did start to feel like um over the last you know year or so like i'd sort of gone down this this mirror world where you know the allegation was uh was taken as fact and you know the onus was on me to disprove it and that's just not a it's not a, a thing that that you can do really that's unfortunately the problem so yeah well and uh and that certainly snowballed uh mm -hmm. eventually so they they these uh bad faith actors went from ignoring your questions about uh you know moderation standards and epistemology and to starting to attack you and other people who study uh, disinformation and misinformation and um you you and others were figures in the twitter files um, yeah like elon musk and his uh i guess so now former uh friends mostly seems like uh but um what what was the i guess maybe do do a little brief overview of that and yeah how did that 
So we had done a bunch of work, um, you know, public work. It was all over the internet um, in 2020, looking at uh, what we called misinformation at the time, but became pretty clear that it was like election rumors, right? It was um, people who were trying to delegitimize the election preemptively. And we had a very narrow scope. We were looking at uh, things that, as you know, like um, uh, Mackey's things about vote on Wednesday, not on Tuesday kind of stuff. So we were looking for content that was trying to interfere in the process of voting or content that was trying to delegitimize voting. And so we did this very complicated, um, comprehensive project over the course of uh, about August to November of 2020, tracking these rumors as they emerged. Um, with a bunch of students working on the project, really very student driven. Uh, we connected with tech platforms every now and then to say things like, hey, you know, here's a viral rumor. It seems to violate your policies. You know, have at it, do whatever it is you're going to do. Uh, we connected with state and local election officials occasionally, mostly to say things like, um, you know, they would reach out sometimes. They would, uh, we called it filing a ticket. They would sort of file a ticket um, and they would ask about content that they saw that was wrong. Right. And so that was stuff like, um, hey, we've got this person, this account, it's claiming to be a poll worker. We have no record that anybody with that name is a poll worker, but it's saying a lot of stuff that's just wrong. And we're worried that it's going to undermine confidence in the vote like in that district. So it was the kind of thing that we would look at. And then we would send back a note sometimes um, saying, like, you know, here's what you should do with this. Here's what you should do with that. And the um, so that was the the process that, that that we went through with all these rumors. So, and then in 2021, we did the same kind of thing, but with vaccine rumors. And in that particular case, obviously it wasn't state and local election officials. We would just track the most viral narratives related to the vaccine for that week, published it, PDFs, every PDF, <laughs> once a week on the website, completely public, anybody could see them. Um, and that was, and then we would send them to people who'd signed up for our mailing list. And that included public health officials, uh, some folks in government, anybody who wanted to receive that briefing, which was just a repurposing of what was on the website. So those were our projects. And um, they were refashioned by the same people who tried to vote not to certify the election or tried to overturn the election, and some of the kind of right-wing COVID influencers as they, they were reframed as not academic research projects, but as part of a vast plot to suppress all of those narratives, to take down and delete all of those tweets, to silence conservative voices. Uh, and as this rumor about our work snowballed, it eventually reached the point where, you know, somebody went on Tucker Carlson to say that we had actually stolen the 2020 election, that this was how we had done it. We had suppressed all of the true facts about voter fraud and all the other things. And as a result, people hadn't voted for Donald Trump. So it was just complete surreal nonsense. But again, you know, having rumors about you on the internet is an inconvenience. It's an annoyance. You get death threats, you know, people send you crazy emails. But what happened that was really troubling was that sitting members of Congress took up the cause and people who had subpoena power then used nothing more than, you know, online lies about our work to demand access to our emails. So the way that this connects to the Twitter files is one of these individuals, a right-wing blogger uh, who created this website that he called the Foundation for Freedom Online, it was basically just him, uh, began to write these stories about us. And then he aggressively, repeatedly over a period of almost two months, tried to get Matt Taibbi to pay attention to him. And eventually in March of 2023, he connects with Taibbi, who's been doing several of these Twitter files, in a chat room, uh, in, a, in a, sorry, in a Twitter spaces kind of voice chat. And he tells him, I have the keys to the kingdom. I'm going to tell you about that CIA woman <laughs> who works at Stanford, who has FBI level access to Twitter's internal systems. And now these are words that mean nothing. Like, What the hell does FBI level access mean? And I never had access to any internal system at Twitter. But again, it doesn't matter because he piques Tybee's interest, connects with him, and then all of a sudden, Jim Jordan is requesting that Tybee come and testify about the Twitter files. And rather than testifying about the things that are actually in the Twitter files, he and Michael Schellenberger, who's the co-witness, start to just regurgitate the claims about the mass suppression of conservative speech that this individual has written on his blog. 
So there's no evidence that is actually offered, but in response to the allegation being made, Jim Jordan then demands all of our emails. And so all of a sudden, you know, Matt Taibbi and Michael Schellenberger say some stuff on Twitter and Jim Jordan gets to read my emails. And that's really all it takes. And that was the part where I was like, wow, we are really, uh, you know, I um, maybe rather naively thought that there was like more evidence required to kick off a massive congressional investigation. But, um, you know, that's not how yeah. it works today. Well, and, and and ironically, it was named by the or done by the House Committee on Government Weaponization. Uh, <laughs> it turned into nothing but weaponizing government. Yeah, um, I mean, the whole thing is, um, I mean, honestly, it should be kind of depressing <laughs> to anybody who, you know, when, you, when you realize that it's really just norms that are keeping the wheels on the bus. Um, and that when you move into this environment where the end justifies the means, um, that there is very little in the way of, of, you know, guardrails on this sort of stuff, except, you know, basic decency. And, um, you know, and a, or more in more Machiavellian terms, like a, a sense that this is going to come back and bite them. But it's not. It's not going to at all. Nothing is ever going to happen either to the people who lied or to the bloggers or to the Twitter files guys or to the members of Congress who weaponized the government to target the First Amendment protected mm -hmm. research of random academics. Nothing is going to happen to any of them, there will be no consequences. And that's when you start to realize that um, there's really very little that is, uh, you know, <laughs> we, we've we've created a kind of it together, terrible system yeah. of incentives here, yeah. Uh, yeah, and um, and what's, what's awful is, I think that even now after what happened, so, I mean, we, we need to say that, you know, after all the, the legal threats and there were other ones as well, uh, mm -hmm. the Missouri versus Biden case and some of the other ones uh, that targeted the Stanford Internet Observatory. I mean, the goal was to shut yeah, the, 100%. the program down yes. and they succeeded. Yeah, they did. Um, and yet I don't I feel like that generally speaking, you know, people outside of the people who directly work in this area I don't think that there is any concern about this problem at all, or That's, very little. I yeah, this is where what I've tried to do, like you know, I'll be fine. I'm not worried about like me. <laughs> um, but one of the things that one of the people that I spoke with um, when it all began to happen, you know, when the first kind of congressional letters showed up were some of the climate scientists, like Michael Mann, I reference in the book, um, who had been through this with his own sort of fight in the pre-internet days of 2012. But again, when he had done research that was politically inexpedient, right, showing that, um, that you know, the sort of hockey stick graphs um, around, uh, around climate change and kind of human, uh, human impacted climate change. And he wound up getting hauled in front of congressional hearings, having his email gone through, you know, a whole bunch of different things happened to him. And um, one thing I was struck by was how familiar the playbook was, right? And I read uh, Naomi Araskasi's book, Merchants of Doubt. And she also goes into it with regard to uh, scientists who were trying to say, hey, it looks like tobacco is really not great. Looks like it might cause cancer, you know, and this sort of retaliation and uh, and and what you see from the companies where they say, like, we just have to discredit the people who are saying this, right? We don't have to offer, we don't even have to bolster our facts. We just have to attack these people. That That's what's going to work, right? Smearing them is the most effective thing to do here. We just have to create doubt, a lack of confidence in what they've done and said. We have to turn them into enemies. And you see that model of the smear working very, very well whenever there is something that is um, politically inexpedient. And again, the people who were, quote unquote, investigating us uh, were the people who were very angry that we had done this very comprehensive kind of research project tracking the big lie. And the people who propagated the big lie were the ones who were mad at it. And once they had gavels, they retaliated. That's how it works. The, um, the problem is that playbook is very effective. It's very hard to respond to rumors and smear campaigns. Institutions are notoriously bad at it. Um, and so the question then becomes like, which field gets attacked next? 
And that's where what I think like the focus shouldn't be on us or SIO or, you know, any one institution that's experiencing this. It should be on how effective that playbook is. And the thing that we need to see is people doing more work on countering the effects of that playbook, on pushing back on smears, on fighting much more aggressively um, when Congress comes calling in this way. And that that I think is the uh, the, the key takeaway <laughs> from like from my cautionary tale. Mm. Yeah. There's just so much that needs to be done. And and there's so much money that is being out there to promote falsehoods to the public. And I think that that's, you know, uh, I mean, because the, the, the issue is that for, the, you know, reactionary media, reactionary foundations, organizations, they don't engage in general interest like public philanthropy. So in other words, they're not out there you know, feeding the homeless from their foundation or, you know, helping people register to vote or, you know, whatever, you know, various things like that, um, or, you know, funding cleanup projects or, or something, you know, they're, they're not doing that. And so we're, and so all of their money is focused on altering politics. Um, whereas the people who are, you know, the non-reactionary majority, the, the philanthropists, they have to support all these other institutions like the Red Cross or, you know, all these things that are not political. Um, and so the philanthropy is is split, but it's also missed. Like they don't understand yeah. that you have to actually create things that are in favor of reality and anti um, you know, uh, the, the bit that because like basically what we're what we're seeing is the emergence of a of an anti-epistemology yeah. and and to me the the analogy that i use sometimes with people is hg uh, wells ha had his uh, book the the novel the time machine and at some point in the future the humans in that area had speciated into two groups and there were the the uh the eloi that lived uh, uh, um during the daytime and you know they had solved all problems for themselves and scarcity and whatnot um but they were totally unaware that there was this other group of post humans who lived at night and preyed on them. Um, and like, I feel like there's so, so many knowledge <laughs> workers and institutions, they don't realize that, the, that, you know, we're living in an information economy where there are predators. <laughs> uh, it's a good metaphor for it. Yeah. <laughs> and they've got to, they've got to wake up to that because, their, you know, their whole, everything that they do is actually under attack. If, if not now, it will be later. Yeah. Uh, everything has a liberal bias uh, in this worldview. And um, no matter who it is, like, it, I mean, it started with the academia, then it went to, to journalism, then it went to, you know, now it's with the FBI is liberally biased, an agency created <laughs> by a far right, uh, you know, Republican J. Edgar Hoover and never run by anyone who was a Democrat, registered Democrat. But it's liberally biased. It's liberally biased. Um, and police are that now, the woke military, like everything is liberally biased. And like until you realize there are people out there that want to completely tear down all institutions um then you're you're not going to win i don't think i don't know it's kind of depressing <laughs> i mean that was the uh the one thing i wish i'd been more direct on in the book was was actually that point right it's the uh the need to understand that um you know that it 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 comes for people and that you don't have to do anything wrong in order for it to happen. I think, I think there's still a, you know, even like my parents, you know, <laughs> I was like, oh, I got a congressional subpoena and Stephen Miller sued me. And they're like, what did you do? And I was like, no, <laughs> <laughs> that's not how this works, you know, because, because yeah. they, they live in a time when, you know, or, or they, their, their model of politics is still this, you know, obviously if you're being investigated, like there's some Mm -hmm. cause for it. And, you know, and, and I'll confess also that, um, you know, I, I really did not realize how much um, things like lawsuits and everything else were just, you know, stuff that you could just file and that you could just, you know, gum up a person's life with meaningless requests and all these different procedural 
you know, all the procedural drama that went along with it. And, you know, I, um, we found out that Stephen Miller had sued us when Breitbart tweeted it at us. And I, um, remember seeing that and being like, is this even real? You know, don't, doesn't somebody show up to your, to your door with papers or something? Um, and my, my Twitter sued, like, <laughs> how does this work? But they were doing it because they were fundraising off of it. Right. The, uh, you know, the, the groups that were part and parcel to the lawsuit. And I thought, Oh, I get it now. Oh, that's so interesting. I always thought that, you know, the, the legal system was, um, you know, maybe biased in some ways around some types of cases, you know, we read the stats about criminal prosecutions and things, but I'd never paid that close attention. It wasn't really a thing that, um, that I followed and, uh, you know, and then all this started and I thought like, oh boy, wow, there's really, a, <laughs> there's really a whole lot of interesting, uh, things about this that I had no idea about. And I guess I'm going to get an education pretty quickly. Uh, yeah, well, and, uh, I mean, it, so, but at the end of the book, you do talk about some things that have worked in the past. Uh, yeah. And, you know, I mean, and it is the case, I mean, unfortunately, the legal system has been badly corrupted uh, by politicized and yeah. ideological judges. Um, but nonetheless, um, you know, like you uh, talk about one instance that I that is kind of entertaining about uh, Procter and Gamble. Oh, the yeah. Conspiracy theory in the 80s against them. Uh, why don't you tell us about that? Yeah, this was uh, one of these satanic panic type things. There's a um, allegation that their logo uh, which was a man with sort of stars in his beard, um, had six, six, sixes in the curly cues and was, uh, you know, um, evidence of some sort of satanic involvement. And what's interesting about rumors, which is just these, you know, unverified information, people feel very compelled to share it. It's interesting. It's salacious. And what you see is this rumor that they're somehow connected to Satanism begins to take off. Um, and the challenge for them is like, how to respond to it. And this was, you know, it's actually not the most uplifting story <laughs> because what you see them do is they try to put out fact checks, right? They try to explain where the artwork came from. Um, they are looping in, uh, they loop in some prominent evangelicals of the time, trying to get them to be the messenger saying, no, this is, you know, this is not real. Um, it comes out that actually, um, was it, uh, I think it was Amway, right? That one of their competitors was behind this in some way was, was actually trying to promote, you know, it was trying to, it was sending out these, these rumors was like giving it to their membership, calling people and these sorts of things. Um, they wind up suing, you know, they wind up suing the, the people who were spreading the rumors. Um, but ultimately they do eventually abandon the logo, which is the, the sort of <laughs> depressing part of the story for me, um, which is that it speaks to, you know, if you don't deny it, it's, it doesn't go away, right? The rumor continues to, to sort of ossify and spread. If you do deny it, people aren't necessarily going to believe you. You try to bring in your various uh, advocates who can speak on your behalf. You aggressively sue the people who, uh, you know, who, who it turns out are, are doing this to you. And we've actually seen that happen more, right? Some of the election rumors, uh, Dominion, of course, won that, um, that settlement from Fox News. I think, I'm trying to, I don't remember, I think Smartmatic's uh, yet to be decided. Um, but you have this, uh, you know, this challenge of how do you respond? And um, yeah, I, I kind of wish they'd stuck with the logo, <laughs> but uh, I don't know. That, that was the one of these sort of canonical case studies and the challenge of responding to modern rumors. Yeah. Well, and I mean, one of the things you do talk about also a little bit is understanding that these rumors and, you know, falsehoods that are circulated in many cases, they are based on real beliefs uh, that are not related or real concerns that are maybe even le legitimate uh, concerns. And that, um, you know, trying to it just immediately cut off those topics from discussion, it, that's not all, that's not going to be effective either because, and I, I think probably the best example of that is the, is the belief that the the um, SARS CoV two virus you know was created in a in, in oh, weapons lovely. laboratory yeah lovely hypothesis like it wasn't like when I first heard that I was like oh that I don't I would love to see the evidence for that like that was my reaction for it yeah I didn't but, I didn't think it was that outrageous a claim right I um so yeah. the first the first 
I wrote an article about this, um, the bioweapon, right? The, the, that it was a bioweapon was part and parcel. Like the, these two things emerged almost simultaneously. And I wrote about the bioweapon allegation because China made bioweapons allegations about the US even as this was happening. So I was talking about it as this like this sort of interesting great power propaganda battle that was uh, that was unfolding. And what was interesting was that the Chinese to support their allegation were nut picking from American loons, right? They were grabbing these like these American lunatics who were like upset about Fort Detrick. Those were the people that China was pointing to saying, look, some people on the internet, some, some Americans on the internet are saying that COVID is a bioweapon created by the United States. And that was where they went with it. And I thought it was very interesting that our kind of online conspiracy theorists were split between like who had created the bioweapon. Um, this, is, this is very common, I find, in conspiracy theories today. It's like it's like superposition, you know, you're like waiting for the observable thing to like collapse reality down into one state, but you have these, these sort of two conflicting explanations growing simultaneously until all of a sudden everybody forgets about one. So we do move past the idea that the US created it and we zero in then on the um on the that, that China created it. And what's interesting though is that the lab leak doesn't require the bioweapon component. The lab leak is the accidental release. And that I was like, okay, you know, yeah, it's, it's in the realm of the plausible. But um it gets caught up in social media moderation policy. And I think that there was a huge own goal, in my opinion, because I think if you are making arguments for what kind of content should be throttled or taken down, right? When you when you go through the rubric of like how the world should be moderated, if you're making an argument that something should be throttled or taken down, particularly taken down, there's a massive backfire effect to doing it. And so the only time I think it's justified is if there's some really clear material harm that comes from the information being out there or viral or promoted. And so I do think something like the false cures can rise you know, to that level at certain times. But the lab leak hypothesis, like it was really hard to, to find a thread in which it was overtly, directly harmful in a way that a lot of the other COVID narratives were. And so, yeah. you know, I, I felt like it, it undermined like legitimacy in content moderation by being something of an overreach with no discernible justification. And I, that was my, uh, I think I write this in the book, right? I just thought it was uh, one of these things is not like the others as you look at this very long list mm -hmm. of policies and, and, uh, and rubrics. And for that one to be in there, I think it was like marginally grouped in there under the allegation that saying it was a lab leak was racist. And even that I was like, I don't know, I'm pretty center left. Like <laughs> I'm not seeing it. Like, where's the, you know, where, mm -hmm. where are we getting this from? So that, that one, I thought well, was I mean, called. Yeah, or they, it was an inability un, to understand it. Uh, yes, you can f use that in a racist way, but right. the idea itself is not implicitly racist. Um, right. It's just not. And, you know, and, and they did, and Twitter did the same kind of overreach with regard to Hunter Biden's laptop. Now, yeah. I should say that I personally was involved in the back end of that along with other reporter friends of mine that oh, we were all trying to get that that data uh when they started talking about it and rudy's people wouldn't give it to anyone um really and, that's interesting i heard that yeah, fox, and, like hadn't fox turned it down that was the story that i heard about that one they did also yeah they refused to run it yeah. um and uh and then when the new york times ran a story about it the, the the evidence that they offered for it was nonsense. Interesting. Uh, it was a reassembled screenshot of a of a you know a tweet like that's basically oh, what it that... was. And like they didn't. In other words, there was no there was no metadata that was provided. There was nothing. There was no source of anything. It was literally just screenshots of iMessage, which anyone can make those. Like th that's not proof of anything. Uh, and the, the fact that Rudy was vouching for it meant <laughs> probably like less signal. than zero. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't work on that. I mean, it's funny because, um, like, what, like I said, the election integrity partnership—the work that we did was looking at 
things related to voting and things related to delegitimization. And that was out of scope on all of it. So my one comment on that, my one public comment on that was actually in a conversation with Barry, with Barry Weiss, when I said, um, as the moderation decision was unfolding, I said, I think it's, I think it's real overreach here. I don't think this is the right call. It's already out there. It's a New York Post article at this point. It's not the hacked materials policy. By all means, the non-consensual nudes, like moderate those away, like 100%. That is not a thing that nobody opts into that by being the child of a presidential candidate. You know, that was, I think, completely the, the right call was to, you know, to remove the, the nudes as they begin to, to, to make their way out. But the article itself, I said, okay, this is really an overreach. What Facebook did was they temporarily throttled it while they tried to get some corroboration of what it was. And then they let it they let it go, right? And that is, I think, a reasonable call compared to uh, to where Twitter went with it. But I mean, these are the, you know, what you see in, ironically, the Twitter files about this, is you see that people in Twitter trying to make this decision with incomplete information, and they're, they're not out there saying like, man, we really need to suppress this because, you know, it will help Biden, or we really need to suppress this because like, you know, F Donald mm -hmm. Trump, you just see them trying to, yeah. trying to make this call in a, you know, very sort of human way. So the yeah. whole thing I thought oh, was and, um, yeah, the Twitter and, files and though. Go ahead. No, you uh, go ahead. <laughs> the one thing that I thought was really funny about it was uh, the way it tied into the Twitter files was um so nothing to do with us again. Nothing. But they decided that um like Aspen Institute had held this um kind of threat casting, you know, what if there is another hack and leak in the 2020 election, thinking about the hack and leak that had happened in 2016, right? The Clinton emails and the um, the Podesta emails and the DNC, it was the DNC's emails. So they were like, okay, so this is, you know, one of the scenarios they come up with is that there is some hack and leak related to Hunter Biden and Burisma. And that was the scenario that they come up with. So this then comes to figure into the, you know, the sort of conspiracy theory universe is like, oh, they were pre-bunking it. They knew this was going to happen. And the FBI, in cahoots with Aspen, in cahoots with Twitter, tried to, you know, tried to get them to do this. And that was the, uh, that was the narrative that they, that they ran with. And I thought, you know, I wasn't at that round table, but that, that tabletop exercise, but like scenario planning is, you know, it's a pretty common thing, right? I, you know, most political groups, game out various scenarios. It was just sort of weird to me that um, that that became the, you know, the, that there was like this, they had to come up with some cause to justify Twitter's moderation decision instead of just reading what Twitter itself said in the moment, which is like people trying to figure out what to do and really not knowing. So they yeah. had to come up with a whole conspiracy theory about it. Um, yeah. And you know, and 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 I guess we 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 should say that you know, if it if they had just let it go the way you know and not done anything to it, that um, it wouldn't have been that big of a deal. But like no. now, there's this giant mythology built around it that you know the Hunter Biden laptop story was suppressed, and that is the reason that Joe Biden <laughs> won in 2020. And it's like no one voted for Hunter Biden, and <laughs> and like. The idea of, you know, presidential relatives who are screw ups like that's super common. Like, uh, well, you know, that's just a th that is a thing in and of itself. You're not voting for the relatives, but it, yeah, it's just so it, it's again like these are not le they're not good faith arguments right. that we're that they're making here. And, and I, I think we should point that out, even as we do criticize uh, Twitter for doing I, the right that's thing. a good point. And I um. I don't know what, this is one of these things where maybe, you know, there's been bad faith politics before, but as I was going through like historical research and stuff, trying to figure out how did people respond to rumors? How did they respond to smears? That question of like, what do you do with the bad faith attacks is one that I don't think I've seen a whole lot of, uh, like everybody is very good at documenting that they are bad faith, documenting the rumor, documenting who spreads it and how and all that other stuff. But that response piece is what is still missing, that sort of calm strategy. Like, how do you deal with this? Because I know I feel when I get asked about, you know, these, these crazy, you know, Twitter files, bullshit claims about the CIA placing me in my job, I'm like, is it even worth 
explaining the grain of truth underlying the fact that I once worked there 20 years ago or, you know, because it, it feels so pointless when yeah, I wonder sometimes if the appropriate response is that's bad faith bullshit and I'm just not going to deal with it again. You know, if you want to read about it, go read it on the Internet. I actually really don't know at this point what the uh, what the appropriate response strategy is. I know people think that, you know, that, that we should know. I know we tell election officials and public health officials and things like respond quickly, you know, get the facts out there. But that that doesn't necessarily diminish or respond to the bad faith attack. It's simply putting out alternate information and hoping that people find it compelling. So. Uh, yeah, no, it is. A, it's a problem. And I mean, it's honestly, I, I feel like the solution part, even though you do talk a little bit about it. Uh, in the book that that's probably its own book. Um, yeah, I think so too. Probably. That's the um, next book. <laughs> oh, okay. I'll, I'll, I'll go reach out to all the people who've been smeared. And <laughs> 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 no, I think about, um, remember the book, So You've Been Publicly Shamed? That's sort of like, um, gosh, when did that come out? That was, uh, that was when, remember, I think it was Justine Sacco is her name, right? She made that AIDS joke on the plane, got off the plane, and the entire world mm -hmm. had been, has Justine landed yet? Um, that was one where I think it, it gets at this question of what do you do when there's a mass attention mob, right? That sort of online mobbing, but that question of, uh, how do you respond to bad faith attacks? I think is, uh, you know, one of the, one of the main ones for our politics right now. It is. Um, yeah. And, um, uh, yeah, getting people to realize that Alex Jones was right about one thing. There is an information war. Yeah. And um, only one side has been fighting it, though, unfortunately. And so, yeah. Anyway, but we... Uh, we started a whole conversation about Kamala and the coconuts on the couch. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I know we're, like, coming up on uh, on the hour here, but, uh, you know, yeah. I, the sort of... I, I've been really entertained, I have to say, by, by watching that whole... Um, the, uh, the sort of instantaneous vibe shift, the... J.D. Vance is weird as the message. Not even we're mm -hmm. going to go through his policies and fight them point by point. No, just like the whole thing is weird. You know, that's it. Just diminish it, brush yeah. it off, ridicule it. Um, maybe that's the uh, maybe that's the answer. I've been watching again, not because of any particular um, interest in you know the candidacy as such, but the sort of meta question of the the mechanics of the messaging in the race, mm -hmm. I think are really interesting. Yeah. Well, and yeah, the, the couch rumor, um, I think is, it has been an illustrative of, of how different that each side of the spectrum handles things that are jokes or memes that, you know, uh, on the right, they believe them, uh, you know, if there's, and I mean, gosh, there's just so many examples <laughs> of that, <laughs> you know, I mean, there was never any evidence that Barack Obama was born in Kenya. Ever. Nobody right. ever. They didn't even like I never even heard anybody talk to Kenyans administrative. They didn't even bother to provide evidence for it. And yet they believed it. And, you know, and then like the, the thing with J.D. Vance and, and uh, his alleged proclivities for intercourse, intersectional <laughs> intercourse, intercourse um, that, you know, people on the, on the political left, they knew it wasn't true and they said it wasn't true, but they were just like. But, but we're, we're, we're going to, but we're, it's fun. And we're going to talk about it because it fits within a larger point. And that right. this guy is a very strange individual. Uh, yeah. And, you know, and like that it is, it is a flipping of the script that has just been enraging uh, because I mean, and I think uh, Jesse Waters, uh, the, the Fox uh, host, and actually, I guess I'll play the, let me see if I can get the clip here so I can roll it. Uh, in the show here. So yeah, like Jesse Waters, the Fox News Channel host, he was he was outraged, almost like on the verge of tears, frankly, uh, on his program this week uh, as we're recording here. I'm going to roll it. They're accusing J.D. Vance of having sex with a couch. Not on a couch, with a couch. Notice they. It's a weird thing. <laughs> Who's that? And now they're calling him weird. 
I don't think Kamala Harris is going to pick anyone uh, as weird and creepy uh, as J.D. Vance. Frankly, J.D. Vance, just dumb Vance, is pretty weird. It's not just a, 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 a weird style that he brings. It's that this leads to weird policies. They're just weird. Donald Trump and his weirdo running mate. More extreme, more weird, more erratic. The agenda, the way they talk to people, the way they address people. It is bizarre. It's, it's weird. It is weird. Well, it's just plain weird. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's the box you put that in, right? Democrats made up a story about J.D. Vance having sex with a couch and called him weird 150 times this weekend. Yep. So, and it's, it's funny because not only is... Is he mad that people on the left copied the Fox News business model in a parody? <laughs> like, that is literally what Fox News has done for 30 years, is traffic in things they know to be false, uh, but also present them as true. Like, you, in his montage there, he didn't present any Democrat who said that J.D. Vance had sex with the couch. Nobody said that. <laughs> um, <laughs> and so people on the but, internet then, but it, <laughs> yeah yeah and then, and then he and he lied though he said democrats came up with this that they're the ones who said jd vance had sex with the couch and that wasn't true like no. he, he's he's calling people liars and he can't even get his basic facts straight like to me this is I, you couldn't get a better illustration of the information economies of both sides of the aisle yeah. I, I was surprised that um, that they went for it. I was actually curious to see how he was going to respond per like our chat about how do you respond to smears and bad faith attacks and things like this. It's not it's not quite the same as a bad faith attack. It's like when you're memed, right? It's slightly different process. But the um, but he said nothing, and that was interesting to me because that provided an opportunity for John Oliver to say, well, he didn't deny it. Right. But then if he had denied mm -hmm. it, then that would have been, you know, you're kind of damned if you do, damned if you don't. So I thought, okay, well, he's going to, I was actually waiting for him to get in on the joke, right. That, that, you know, to, um, to post something sort of funny or like make himself part of it. Some like Ikea catalog picture or whatever, but mm -hmm. that's not what happened. And, and I thought this is really interesting because it's, um, I generally speaking feel like a lot of the right wing influencers are generally better at sort of flipping the script and making the meme work in their favor. But this time that wasn't the direction it went. So, so it's been interesting to see how the, how the different sides are acting in this, you know, around this kind of stuff this time. Uh, yeah, it has. And uh, I mean, and it, I think it also, it is illustrative also that, you know, with, with uh, Joe Biden out of the race and uh, the much younger uh, Kamala Harris in the race that it's, it has energized a lot of younger uh, yeah. so people who are politically left that are just like, you know, they didn't want to make memes for Joe Biden because he wouldn't understand them. <laughs> and uh, neither would his advisors. Like, even if they had made him, the, the Biden people wouldn't have really picked him up uh, or in an effective way. I don't know. So it's definitely been kind of a, a funny break from the traditional disinformation beat. I yeah, I know it's the, genera <laughs> the the generational shift, I guess, and the you know how that um, how that's used, how you know a younger flavor of uh, you know institutionalist, if you will, is is going to to pivot it. So I guess we'll see. Yeah. Well. Um, all right. So I, I guess uh, we're getting to the end here. Just to go back to solutions here. Um, you know, there's ultimately, I think the solutions have to be broader and more education oriented rather than technology oriented, because these are not technology problems. These are yeah. epistemic problems. One, one, one of the things that's probably going to have to be essential, and you do talk about it quite a bit, is is transparency that, yeah. you know, transparency has to be done at both by the social media companies, but also by the governments that people need to know what's going on and like ultimately that's is the source of a lot of these informational problems is that when there's no one providing information, then people who are making shit up, <laughs> they're the one, they're the only ones that are there. So they're going to get believed in some sense, just regardless of quality. 
This was the, um, the, the, the interesting thing for me as the smear campaigns were starting with us and, and my stuff was, um, you know, the canonical comms response is like, oh, you don't answer, you don't say anything, you know, you, the, you wait for the news cycle to move on. I don't think that that works in this information environment anymore. I think that the, the, that, that narrative battleground is constantly going, it's constantly happening. And if you're not contributing directly as yourself, honestly, um, you're, you're missing an opportunity to authentically communicate your side very directly. And, and this is where uh, I, I think that the more top-down model of institutional comms, whether it's in you know COVID or elections or you know <laughs> attacks or any of it, any, any of the different things that that I talk about in the book, um, the idea that you kind of wait patiently for mainstream media to reach out and then you give a quote and then that is how truth is established and narratives are formed. It's just a very old way of thinking about it. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, we could probably do this for a lot longer, but uh, I'm sure I, this is not a Joe Rogan podcast. So I'm not going to subject, <laughs> not, not, not gonna subject everybody, everybody three hours. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, but so for uh, people who uh, want to uh, keep up with your stuff, um, what's your recommendation? Yeah. So I am on Threads, Blue Sky, and Mastodon. Um, I have a newsletter now. I only post occasionally when I think something interesting has happened you know, like JD Vance and his couch. Um, but uh, mm -hmm. yeah, um, those are the the ways to to stay in touch. So. Okay, cool. And the book is Invisible Rulers. Uh, oh man, I don't have the guy run. Uh, the people, I'm trying to read it off your shoulder here. What, here <laughs> why don't you uh, tell, tell us the name, yeah, say the name of the book again so everybody it's will get it. Invisible away. Rulers, the people. <laughs> <laughs> the people who turn lies into reality. Okay. All right. Well, thanks for being here again. Thanks. thanks for having me. All right. So that is the program for today. I appreciate everybody joining us for the discussion. And you can always get more if you go to theoryofchange.show. We have the full video, audio, and transcripts of all the programs. And I appreciate everybody who is a paid subscribing member. You get a few bonuses now and then. And I really appreciate your support. And if you're not able to support financially, please do give us a review on iTunes or Spotify or wherever else you happen to be watching. That's much appreciated. Thanks a lot, and I'll see you next time.